everyone. I'm glad to be back, although it's a lot warmer here than where I was. It's uh, in the mountains of West Virginia, probably low 80s, and here it's high 90s. It feels like it anyway. But I appreciate y'all letting it rain a little bit while we're gone, so my grass wasn't brown when I got back. That was good. Well, this morning we're going to be in John chapter 20. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me there. John chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 24, go through the end of the chapter. And if I can preach fast next week, that's big if, uh, we may finish the book next week. So we'll see. So you need to start praying now that God will help me to know where to go once this book is ended. I'm running out of books to preach through. I had one person laugh. That was my wife. Well, I guess I'm not as funny as I thought I was. Cause anyway, uh, this morning I want to talk to you about uh, faith. You know, there's a time in a lot of our lives where we miss something big and we wish we could have been there for it. Uh, if you have children, you may miss the first time your baby walks or the first words that child ever says, or you may hear, you know, there was a big party and you wouldn't believe what your crazy uncle did at this party. Oh, you should have seen it. You should have heard it. And you say, well, I had to work and you missed it. And You know, it's a big uh, opportunity that's gone and you never have it again. Well, that's kind of what happened within the text that we're reading today. Jesus has risen from the dead, and he has appeared to ten of the twelve apostles. Now, one of them's dead because he's a betrayer, and he's Judas, and he died and he went to hell because he killed himself and after he turned his back on Jesus. So he's not around anymore. He, he, he's in hell not because he killed himself, but because he rejected Jesus. But he's gone. And then you have Thomas, who's another one. And of the 12, 11 are left, and Thomas just did not happen to be in the room that night when Jesus showed up. Now, the question may come to your mind, why in the world did Jesus not wait until all 11 were there? Well, he didn't wait because God in his sovereign plan knew that we would need what's going to be written in this text today. Because Thomas wasn't there, and in not being there, there was unbelief in his heart. Everybody else saw Jesus. He didn't get to see Jesus. Well, you and I haven't seen Jesus either. Uh, we've not seen his bodily, physical presence. And so you and I are going to find ourselves in the same place that Thomas found himself. And so we want to know what the Bible says about faith and about believing because what Thomas has gone through is what many are also going to go through. But God has something to teach us about faith from this text. So let's read it together and see what God has for us from this word about believing in Jesus. Verse 24, John chapter 20. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger. See my hands, reach here your hand and put it in my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You ever gotten a bad rep or a bad rap for something you did and maybe because of something you did that you got a nickname and it just stuck with you? The guys are real good about giving nicknames, aren't we? My dad probably had at least three that were real popular in his life. He called them Junior, Junebug, and Bugs, like Bugs Bunny. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll call each other things like 
uh, stinky and squeaky and snot and booger, and we, we just make up all kinds of names for people, don't we? And, and sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, let me tell you a nickname that's stuck for 2,000 years. You know it, I can guarantee you. Doubting, oh, I didn't have to finish, did I? Doubting Thomas. How'd you like to have that for a nickname? 2,000 years later, people are still calling him Doubting Thomas. Now, I don't know it's completely fair, but it's there. I, I say it's not fair because when we read the other gospel accounts, what we find out is that Thomas is not much different from all the rest of them. All the apostles were doubting at the very beginning. They forgot that Jesus had made promises that he would rise from the dead. They forgot about all the scriptures he had taught them that had to do with him rising from the dead. Uh, they should have known better. They should have believed they didn't. So when the women went to the tomb, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. They come and speak to the apostles. What do they do? They don't believe. Thomas is no different from the rest of them, but he got the nickname and it stuck. Doubting Thomas. Well, we don't want to be doubters. We want to believe. We want to have faith. So let me talk to you about faith. Let me share with you a few things about faith, just some thoughts in general about faith, and then we'll build upon that, and I'll give you some thoughts from the text, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, the first thing that you need to remember about faith is the Bible teaches that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, take that exactly the way it's said, because I'm giving you a quote from the book of Hebrews. You cannot please God without faith. In fact, when we were in the book of Romans two weeks ago, and we finished at chapter 14 on Sunday night, the last verse in that text talked about faith, and it, um, and it said that uh, you've got to, with anything that is not of faith is sin. I've got to say it the right way. Whatever is not of faith is sin. So if you can't live your life in a way that is believing that there is a God and that he's a rewarder of those who know him and please him and serve him, whenever you can't act in faith, it becomes an act of sin. You've got to believe that God is and that he is going to bless and that you are honoring him in the things that you do. And if you believe you're not honoring him, then you shouldn't do it because it can't be an act of faith. It's going to turn into an act of sin. And so without faith, it's going to be impossible to please God. What we also know about faith is that it's necessary for salvation. The Bible says, by grace, you're saved through faith. It's not of works, the same man should boast. It's not by grace, you're saved through faith. It's the gift of God. So God gives you a gift of salvation that comes to you through faith. And so when you think about sight, sight becomes an enemy of faith. When you think about seeing Jesus, if you could see him bodily raised from the dead, well, you wouldn't need faith, would you? Because when you see, you don't have to act in faith. You don't have to believe. You just, you know because you've seen it. And so sight can actually work against us in a lot of ways, but you have to have faith in order to be saved and to receive God's gift of salvation. Another thing we know about faith is how it comes to us. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. And so if I'm going to believe in Jesus, I've got to hear from God through His Word. And then once I hear from God, I can respond appropriately, or I can harden my heart and reject what I've heard, but if I'm going to believe, there's got to be some kind of special revelation that is given to me in order for me to have faith. But having said that, let me say something else to you that, that is important and is tied to this text. When it comes to having faith, the Word of God is all you need. You don't need to see Jesus bodily raised. In fact, what we read here is at the very end, when you get down to verse 30, John says these words, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, and we didn't, he didn't write them in the book. So there's an, an, almost an infinite amount of information that John could have given about Jesus, but he only gave you what you needed in order to believe. He says in verse 31, these things have been written, why? So that you may believe. And so the writing inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, 
has been given to us so that faith may come to us. And without the Word of God, you would not be able to believe because anything you know about Jesus, you're going to get from the Word. And so faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. The Word of God is enough. And building upon that, let me say it another way. God has given you everything, everything that you need in order to believe in Jesus. You, you don't need anything else other than this. This is all you need. The Word of God will lead you to have a relationship with Jesus, to have faith in Jesus. And if you say, I need something else, then you're saying, I am the one that's going to set the conditions whereby I'm going to believe. Uh, God's going to need to satisfy me, and, and I'm going to set a standard by which if God doesn't meet that standard, I don't think he's done right by me, and I need more than what he's given me. No, no one gets to do that. Uh, you have to believe based on what God has given you. God has said he's given you enough. You can respond in faith. Um, you know, some people in this day and time, they feel like, well, if God doesn't do this, then, then I shouldn't have to believe in Jesus. Or, or I'll know it's real if God does this. I need proof and I demand it. No, you don't get to do that. Nobody gets to do that. Uh, it's not about you being satisfied. It's about you accepting and receiving what God has given you because, again, he has said he's given enough. You know, there's a guy by the name of Hannibal, not Hannibal Lecter, but another Hannibal, the great general, and he took some elephants and he marched them across the Alps to go invade Rome. Anybody ever heard that history story? Yeah, a few of you. Do you believe it happened? I mean, because you weren't there, you didn't see it. You didn't see any elephants marching across mountains. But we read about it in history books today, and that happened over 200 years before Jesus. So if you're going to start believing things like Julius Caesar, I mean, if you believe Washington crossed the Delaware, I mean, you didn't see that. But, but there's probably not a doubt in anybody's mind that it happened. 500 people, over 500 that knew Jesus before he died, saw him raised from the dead. Men and women, I'm sure, but men certainly, his followers, his apostles, would die rather than deny that Jesus is alive. 2,000 years of history of Jesus changing people's lives. I mean, Jesus is raised. If anybody would be alive from the dead, it would be him. If you can walk on water, feed thousands, cast out demons, heal the lame, the blind, the deaf, and if you can raise the dead yourself, if you say that you're going to rise from the dead, you can do it. He did it. Uh, we've got all that we need. And if Jesus rising from the dead and all the evidence that you have is not enough, including the eyewitness testimonies that have been recorded for us and preserved by the Holy Spirit for 2,000 years, you're not going to get more. This is all you need. And so faith, it comes by hearing. It comes by the Word of God. You don't need anything more than that. But let me say something else that, that also goes along with our text. By God not giving you more, you receive a blessing. Did you know that? Uh, that's what the Bible says here in uh, verse 31. If you were to play a game and say, what's better or what's worse? What's inferior and what's superior? We, we could play games like that. I could ask you, what's better, a computer that was built in the 1970s or a computer that was built today? I mean, they say you've got more computing power in your phone than they had to send a man to the moon. What, that thing in your pocket. So I'm assuming you'd say one built today is better than another one. Uh, let's ask another question. What would be better to be Thomas and to be able to take your finger and put it in the hole in Jesus' hand and to take your hand and put it up into his side where they rammed the spear into him after he had died and to see Jesus bodily raised from the dead? Would that be better or would it be better to believe having never, ever seen the Savior alive from the dead? According to what I read here, the blessing comes to those who have not seen him, and yet you believe. You might think that one would be better than the other. In fact, you're not in an inferior position if you're a believer than Thomas was. You're actually in a better position. The Bible says you're blessed. Remember what that word blessed means? Happy and fully satisfied. It has everything to do with the favor of God 
being upon your life. You have come to know God, to have your sins washed away. You're part of the family of God. Heaven is your home. You get to live an abundant Christian life here and now. Everything is yours because you have Christ. I got a quote here from Johnny Erickson Tata. Do you know who that is? She got paralyzed when she was young for decades. She's been in a wheelchair, snapped her neck. She hadn't been able to move in, uh, for decades now. And she wrote about this verse, and she said, um, I know the meaning of that now. She's talking about what it means to be blessed. She says, the time after my death where I'll be on my feet dancing. See, that's the kind of blessing that you get. I've never seen him. But I know he's real. I know he's there. I know he's saved my soul. And I know what's coming. You don't have to see him. You just have to hear from him. God speaks to you through his word. Do you believe what he said? It, don't miss the blessing that God's got. Blessed are those, I'm sorry, I think I said verse 31, it's verse 29. Blessed are those who did not see and yet they believe. But what do you need to believe? That's a good question. Well, let's go over a few things here that are in this text. Uh, verse um, 31 says that these things have been written for this reason, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, what's involved with being the Christ? Well, that word Christ or Messiah is the same thing. It means anointed one. Uh, and it has to do with the Spirit of God coming upon someone, and that would usually, in the Old Testament days, acknowledge that by pouring oil on someone's head, and that's how they anointed them. But the specific Messiah, Christ, anointed one, was to fulfill all the offices that are given in the Old Testament of prophet, priest, and king. These were all people that were anointed in the Old Testament, and Jesus is the prophet, the priest, and the king. He is the one that the Spirit of God has come upon. And so this means that all of the Old Testament scriptures about the coming one have been fulfilled in him. You've got to believe that this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bringing salvation through the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. He is the Christ. But he's not just the Christ. He goes on beyond that and says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, to say that he is the Son of God makes him equal with God. In fact, if you look up at verse 28, Thomas says these words. Uh, once he hears and sees Jesus, he cries out, My Lord and my God. Think about what Jesus has done here. He's appeared in a closed room, just all of a sudden appeared. He did that before. He's done it again here in this text. Um, when Jesus appears... He's alive from the dead, and he's got scars in his body and these holes there, but yet life is still in his body. But there's something else that's very interesting that you see in this text, and it, it kind of strikes you if you think about it for a minute. Thomas has had a conversation with ten other apostles. Jesus was not bodily present when that happened. But yet when Jesus shows up, he knows everything that's been said. Hey, Thomas, come here. You want to go ahead and put your hand and your finger in my hand? How could he know that? He wasn't there, was he? Well, he's God. God knows everything. God sees, knows everything. He knows the thoughts in your head. He knows every word you've ever spoken. Jesus responds to Thomas even though he was not bodily there. He knows. How does he know? He is God. You need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You need to believe that he is God. You need to believe that he has been bodily raised from the dead. But do you know that you can believe all of that and still die and go to hell? After all, the devil believes all that. In fact, he knows it. Remember, we walk by faith. He saw it. He's seen the risen Savior. Not happy about it. But he knows that Jesus is God, one of the three persons of God. He knows that he's alive. He knows that he bodily came out of the tomb. He knows he's the sent one from God. Thomas doesn't just call Jesus my God. 
He says, my Lord and my God. That makes all the difference in the world, that word Lord. Uh, the word Lord, we might think of it as king. Because that's what they call kings back in England and other places. My Lord, my Lord. They would say things like that. Uh, someone that is in authority over you. You are my Lord. So what does this mean about Thomas? He's not just identified Jesus as God, but he says he's my God. And he is my Lord. You see, when you really have faith in Jesus, there's repentance that takes place. And you're no longer the boss of your life. You're no longer the one that's in charge of yourself. You, you've turned and put your faith in Jesus and become a follower of his. You've surrendered your life to him. you become one that is in allegiance with him and you're a, a obedient to him now. And that's what it means to have Jesus as Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10 talks about this. Uh, it says these words, if I can flip over and get to it. When it talks about salvation, here's what Romans 10 says. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. Now, who are we saved from? We're saved from God. Because God's the one that's angry with us. And God's the one that is going to punish us if we die and go into a Christless eternity. But with Jesus in our life, we face God with Christ, with Jesus' salvation. And the anger of God has now been satisfied in Jesus on the cross so that we don't have to worry and we are rescued or saved from the wrath of God because Jesus on his cross took our sin and took God's anger against us. The Bible says if you believe that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, the person believes and it results in righteousness. With the mouth, he confesses and it results in salvation. So we must confess Jesus as the Lord of our life. But the confession of Jesus as Lord is not just lip service. It's not just mouthing words. It's something that has to come from the heart. It's something that really, deep down, from the inside of you that you want. You want Jesus. You want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You've been living your own way your whole life. And, and that manifests itself in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different rebellious attitudes, from unforgiving spirit to angry uh, violent words and violent behavior to, to drugs and uh, all sorts of abuse and other things like that. You could just run down a whole list of things that people do that are in rebellion against God because their hearts have not turned to him. But you turn away from that lifestyle to turn toward God, and that's what we call repentance. And that's when Jesus becomes the Lord of your life. And if you really believe, repentance has got to be a part of it because you can't say that I believe in Jesus, but... I just wanted to be my Savior, not my Lord. That, that just doesn't work. He is King Jesus. He is God Almighty. I, um, I had some Jehovah's Witnesses knock on my door one time. I think they'd probably like it if you put Baptist preacher on the outside of your door so they won't knock on that door. But um, Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. One of the things about cults is they they add other forms of revelation to the Bible. They make it so that you are not saved by grace through faith. They add works. They say you got to do some things. Uh, they always try to subtract from the deity of Christ. They try to make it so that Jesus will he, he's either a good person or an angel but he's not equal with the Father in his divine nature. Now that's wrong. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three are equally God. Now they're three different persons, but all three, the one is not less God than the other. Now cults, they try to do that. They try to say that Jesus is not as much God as God the Father, but he is. And so they knock on my door, and there's usually one that's been in it for a long time, and there's another one that hasn't been in it very long. They let the one that hasn't been in it very long talk because they're trying to train that person. And I start talking to them about the divinity of Jesus. And I say, let me tell you one of the things that is very strong evidence that Jesus is God. Jewish people, when he was raised from the dead, worshipped him as God. 
Now, a Jewish person is forbidden from worshiping anything other than God. It's in their Ten Commandments. And yet these men that saw Jesus fell at his feet and worshipped him as God. Called him God and worshipped him that way. That's about the time that the one that's got experience grabs the other one and says, let's go. And they, 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 we're going to go talk to somebody else. And Because it's their job to try to find suckers that don't know their Bible that are gullible and try to pull them away. And when they find somebody that knows what they're talking about, they get worried that the one that hadn't been around very long, that Jehovah's Witness is going to get pulled away and know the truth. So they skedaddle. The point being is this. You've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's risen from the dead, he is God Almighty, and you've got to turn to him as Lord of your life. Let me tell you what kind of faith. We've talked about faith and we've talked about what you need to believe. Uh, let me show you another thing about faith. It's in verse 31. It says, these things have been written that you may believe. Is that word believe there? In the original language, it's, it's keep on believing. It's actually kind of a debate sometimes within um, different circles about why, who did John write the book to? Because the Bible says literally keep on believing. And so did he write it to believers? Or did he write it to unbelievers? Did he write it to unbelievers to help them be saved and try to evangelize? Or did he write it to people that were already saved to encourage them in their faith to keep them going? Now, I don't, I don't really think that you have to differentiate because if you're going to keep on believing, you've got to start somewhere. I think John probably wrote it for both. But the truth is that believing in Jesus is not a one-time thing. It's not I come to an altar, say a prayer, and then I never have to think about him again. I never have to live for him or serve him. No, when you believe, your faith is continuous. It's ongoing. For the rest of your life? No, for the rest of eternity. Uh, it, it's forever and ever and ever. Jesus is Lord. He is God. He is King forever and ever and ever. And John wrote these things so that you might Believe if you've never believed before, and you might keep on believing until Jesus comes and takes you home, and for all of eternity you know that Jesus is Lord, God, Master, and Savior. That's what kind of faith you have to have. And so when, when I say something like that, and I talk about how you have to have this forever kind of faith, and He's forever your Lord, let me ask you, have you ever believed like that? Do you know Jesus this way? Is Jesus the one that you serve and that you honor and that you live for? Do you have the kind of faith that repented and began following after Jesus? Because you don't just follow him for one day, you follow him forever. He's not Lord just for one day, he's Lord forever. He is your God forever. Have you ever known someone that believed and they believed for a little while and they quit? I have. And they just tell you, I don't believe anymore. Well, they're lost. Now, you need to hear that because Christians in this day and time, if that person dies, will say, well, they believed when they were a little boy and they're saved, they're in heaven today, even though they denied Jesus for the next 20 years. No, no. It, your, your faith lasts. It perseveres. It keeps on. Uh, he that believeth unto the end shall be saved. It's not those that believe one time and then turn and walk away. Your faith has to continue on, and that's an evidence that the Holy Spirit of God has done something in your heart and in your life. Remember that Jesus said you must be born again. There's a time when faith is birthed into your heart and in your life, and you become a child of God, and you're forever that child of God. You, you don't fall away and quit on Jesus, and you need to fight for your faith because sometimes it's harder to believe than others. And sometimes we go through seasons of doubt and discouragement and despair and, and trials and temptations and things like that. The faith that you have, work hard on it. Keep it. Don't turn and walk away. Don't let anything defeat you and push you out. You've got to believe, and you've got to believe forever. Do you believe? Have you ever believed? Has there ever been a time when you have been born again into the family of God? 
You know, another thing that the Bible teaches about faith is that faith without works is dead. If you've got a faith that doesn't express itself by the way that you live your life, it's not a real faith. In other words, you can say, I believe in Jesus, but if your life, by the way you live it, indicates you don't live like somebody that believes in Jesus, then it's probably evidence that you really don't have Jesus as Lord of your life. Faith without works is dead. One of the works that God gives us for salvation is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says it over and over and over again in the Bible. If you've never believed in Jesus, there's an opportunity for you today. Has there ever been a day where you've called on Jesus and surrendered your life to him and he's become the Lord of your life? You follow Jesus, you want Jesus, and you love Jesus. Peter said, though you've never seen him, you love him. Do you love Jesus? That's an evidence that faith is real and salvation is real. Do you love Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? What do we need to believe? We need to believe Jesus is alive. He is God and he can save us. You've got to believe that Jesus will save you. Some people don't think Jesus will. They say, I, I've just done too much, preacher. I've I've gone too far. I've, I've, I've fallen too far away. There's no sin that you've committed that Jesus cannot and will not forgive. The only thing that will send you to hell is rejecting Jesus. So you need to say yes to him today if you never have. And if you have, you need to celebrate. Because why did John write these things? I've written these things that you may believe and that in believing you may have eternal life. You may, well, he says life. You don't just have eternal life. You have the abundant life. Right here, right now. It starts today. Not later. Now. Because anytime you have life with Jesus, it's good. Pray with me, church. Father.